the presentation today is about um, designing augmented reality systems for speed. And a little bit of background about me. I currently lead the AR engineering team at Niantic Labs, who are the makers of Pokemon Go. So maybe you know about that game that made everyone took the world by a storm in 2016. And Niantic acquired actually my company, Azure Reality. At, at Azure, I was the co-founder and CTO, where we were building the technology for AR that we actually continue to do so at Niantic. Um, prior to that, I've been building large-scale machine learning systems and computer vision systems since 2012. And prior to that, I worked as a, as well as a data scientist at Intel Labs and also at OnQTV, which was a spun-off from Intel and then to Verizon. Now we're going to start with this. So there are only really two hard problems in computer science, right? Yeah, I mean, cache invalidation is very hard to name things and projects. Of course, having that cool mythical name for your open source project, it matters. And of course, one-off errors. So that's in the field of our computer science. And then the question is, why is augmented reality so hard? Why is it that I don't see different people wearing your super cool AR headsets or having AR or VR be pervasive? It's still very much on the fringe. Why don't we see it today? So there's many reasons. Part of it that I'll explain in a bit is, uh, is actually really, really hard to build this for many reasons. Because AR is such an interdisciplinary field. It needs many, many areas and areas of expertise. So before that, you've seen how in a lot of technology, we've seen how sci-fi sometimes becomes sort of the product roadmap for a lot of technology and for AR is really this book by Werner Vinge, Rainbow's End, where he talks about this future where everyone has a retina contact lens where reality, you subscribe to a different reality and is augmented and you live in this world. And, but, but the reality is that most normal people in the world, if, you don't, if you're not a sci-fi reader, don't really know about AR. And most people actually heard about augmented reality, like maybe your children, your parents, grandparents, or random person in the street. They know about AR because of this game that Niantic built that put it in a map, even though it wasn't as high tech as what it was depicted in this sci-fi book. It was uh, good enough to spark the imagination of people. So right now, we are in the company building and pushing that vision forward. So now I'm going to explain why AR is so hard. So part one. In order to augment reality, you need to very first understand the world in order to augment it. And this is really the field of computer vision that takes images and understands the environment. And what you're seeing here is an image of uh, segmentation, semantic understanding, where in computer vision, you can, for the application of AR, there's really two levels of understanding. This is really at the high level, at the meaning, knowing that this particular blob of pixel is a car, is a road, is a tree, and et cetera. And the challenge here is that semantic understanding has really been started to be solved somewhat at the object recognition level with uh, deep learning. And even with deep learning, we're still at the beginning of it. We haven't really crossed to full AI understanding of the world. So it is still very challenging. And deep learning today needs to run on GPUs, which are super, super big and take a lot of power, and they're not going to fit in your pocket. They're probably going to burn a hole in your pocket. So there's that. So the other part of understanding the world is more at the low level, which you don't hear maybe as much, is more at the level of uh, perception of geometry. Really understanding sort of the 3D-ness 3D -ness of the world, knowing a certain blob around here is something that I should avoid and something is far or close. And a lot of this world actually comes from robotics, so robots navigating through the world. They don't really know that something is a chair or no. They just know that I want to avoid it and not bump into it. So that's what your Roomba does. It is a bit more rudimentary. They have kind of um, the bumper sensor plus some of the laser and some of them have a fancy GPS, but they really don't understand that, oh, this is a cat or this is a dog or this is a bookshelf. It just looks like a blob of a thing. So that's a start of a field for uh, understanding the world. And what you see here is an image of uh, a sequence of images of camera frames trying to infer that this particular point that I saw a frame zero and then a frame one and then two and time three 
It's the same point, but there are different um, positions once you start navigating and moving about the world. And that's the same problem in AR, because you have either, let's say, your headset or your camera moving around. And even though in each sequence of images, there are different points in space, but there will be in different distances from where you are in time zero versus time three. So the other hard challenge number two is uh, the need to run in real, real time. And this challenge has origins from the field of what I was mentioning earlier in the field of robotics for sensor fusion and algorithms like SLAM, not this kind of SLAM dunk, but more the SLAM in uh, simultaneous localization and mapping, or VINs, which has to do with uh, navigating in the world. So one of the aspects why this is so challenging is that certain tasks need to run locally and on the device for, to hit the performance requirements so that you don't break the suspen suspense of this belief that you are there in this, uh, interacting with this digital object that's truly there. And why this is hard, just to put it in perspective, uh, the camera feed of a raw image, let's say HD, which is uh, 1080 by 720, is uh, at 30 frames per second, is roughly 600 megabits per second of processing data, raw data. And that's a lot to process in a phone, if you really put it in perspective of how amazing progress we've done so far. So part of it is taking this super high bandwidth data and processing into something that you can understand. What I mentioned in part one is understanding the world. And part of this, just going a bit deeper into what SLAM is, is really this computational pro problem or constructing or updating this map of the world that you want to navigate in. And in a sense, it's a bit of a chicken and egg and problem, because let's say it's sort of a you're dropping to nowhere, you don't have any vision, and you only see a little bit of what you've seen and start building an internal map. So this is the part of why it's called SLAM, simultaneously localizing, knowing where, you, knowing where you are, plus mapping, building this map as you traverse. And there's lots of proper, um, popular approximate solutions. Among them, there's particle filter, extended common filters, graph slam, or more in the category that you see a lot with uh, ARKit and ARCore, uh, more visual odometry and VIN systems, which has to do with uh, using your IMU, your gyro, and accelerometer to plus the visual data to start building roughly where you are in the world. So. How these map of the world look like is something like this. So this is actually a map built with a robot that's navigating around through the street, and is really much a sort of a point cloud created from features of the raw video feed. So imagine kind of taking a walk down the block around here, um, taking all that video in real time and converting it into these points and features. So that's what SLAM does. Now, number three, why? Part still augmented reality, yet another field. So we brought uh, computer vision, we brought robotics, and then the need to display compelling digital objects in the real world. And this is really the field of uh, computer graphics. So it's really marrying computer vision, robotics, graphics, in order to create believable objects that blend into the world. And the challenge is creating uh, objects that can blend in with the lighting variation that we have in the real world, because lighting sources in the world vary a lot, and you don't know how to render it properly. So I was at SIGGRAPH, and I saw really impressive uh, advances right now. There's already work with um, real-time ray tracing, which is amazing. But of course, they had this ginormous close GPU, lots of GPUs to get it done. But to do it in AR, in this tiny cell phone, is not going to happen to be able to create something so realistic and render and believable. So there's still a lot of work to be done there. Now, the other challenge, of course, is the need to create applications in a seamless way. So this is more the developer experience. So you have all these challenging fundamental fields uh, with computer vision, graphics, robotics. And then how do you blend in all of these together and create AR experiences? And this has to do with the field of game development. Game development happens to be naturally where a lot of uh, developers naturally think in 3D. So a lot of uh, popular tools today, environments like Unity and Unreal, already have tons of tooling around for AR and VR development. And a lot of APIs are coming around for that. Uh, but unfortunately, best practices and the development cycle there is still not quite there yet. 
it's actually quite challenging to create, to create AR apps. You could have a development cycle of about five to 15 minutes because the, the challenge is that a normal game development, normal fully virtual, you have a game box where you define the boundaries of your room and where everything is. But for AR, the room is the real world, and the real world is sort of infinite because you don't know where the user is going to navigate. So the development cycle becomes hard because you need to deploy to the phones. And the abstractions for developers haven't been there yet to think about in recent, how do we develop for AR and VR? So those are not quite there yet. There yet. So this is a whole different talk on how to develop for AR and what we're doing to iterate faster. So we've been working on some areas on here, but that's a little bit separate. Now, of course, you need to kind of put all these things together and somehow make it work together and fit it in this or in this. And of course, that if that's all those fields by themselves are not hard enough, we have to make them fit and run fast. So then, this brings me to there are only n to the infinity <laughs> hard problems in augmented reality. To, to name a few, is uh, really the hardest one is real-time computation in tiny devices. So that's the foundation on designing systems around that. Uh, really hard algorithms that take PhDs to design one, many PhDs to design one. Algorithms yet to be discovered because we still don't have fully reliable algorithms that understand the dynamics of the world so that you have the SLAM map that it builds. So what if, uh, uh, as you're building that map, someone moves the bench or moves the couch and that was part of your map? How do you handle that? And then when you come back, what do you do? Or lighting variations because a lot of this light and dark or weather. We, as humans, were able to discern that, but it's really hard for computer vision systems to do that and working indoors and outdoors, and all the variations between hardware devices, so uh, let alone the variations between right now iOS and Android. And between them, there's already sensor variation that are very sensitive to the algorithms. Let's say they have a different accelerometer calibrated differently, or how the calls are done, or the, even the camera parameters, because they all have different uh, camera sensors that might have distortions in them, and they do affect the algorithm. So how do we handle all these challenges? So it's hard. So this is why we don't see the sci-fi version or everyone walking around with AR headsets yet, because it's very hard. So now, there's a bit of hope. So how do we go about and reasoning about the future? So one thing I want to bring up is um, there's uh, Kumi's law. So this is beyond Moore's law, Moore's law at this point, right? So Kumi, Kumi's law is, is, uh, states that at a fixed computing load, the amount of battery you need will fall by a factor of two every year and a half. So that is very significant because that means we will get the same amount of processing, but a fraction of, uh, of, the, battery, of the battery. And for example, this is actually a real benchmark. The iPhone 7 scores better on both single and multi-core uh, benchmarks than any MacBook Air made since 2017, and actually com uh, computes and performs just as good as a 2013 MacBook Pro. So your phone, iPhone 7, is just as good as your MacBook Pro from 2013. So there's something to think about that. And this really has um, um, exploding and, and implications in computing devices becoming smaller and more mobile and with more processing so that we can fit more computation in them. And they are becoming an a, a important factor in terms of economics of also data centers becoming more efficient. So there's two sides of it. So in the future, and, and this is a quote by uh, um, actually uh, Richard Feynman calculated back in 1985 that Based on physics law, the efficiency of computation should be around hundreds of mil a factor of hundreds of billions. And since then, about I guess this calculation was done maybe uh, 2016, uh, only about a factor of 40,000. We've only achieved a factor of 40,000 based on manufacturing and the hardware. So there's still a long room to grow until we hit the theoretical limits of physics. So that's exciting. Now. The other thing that we have on our hand on predicting the future is uh, Ed Holmes' law, that the three telecommunication categories with wireline, wireline in terms of USB, uh, Wi-Fi, or nomadic, nomadic what we call it as uh, cellular, march altogether exponentially almost at a lockstep. 
and their data rates increase on a similar exponential curve, meaning that the slower rates, like uh, cellular, trail just behind the faster ones. So what this means, for example, is that you can now routinely achieve uh, cellular data speeds that match the best of dial-up in 1990s. I know, that doesn't sound too exciting, this dial-up, but, <laughs> but we're getting there. I mean, we're getting to the point where phones are really starting to look like uh, computers, the, the, the capabilities of them. So that's, 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 that's kind of exciting. And the more interesting thing about here, if you kind of extrapolate beyond, is that forward indicates the convergence of actually wireless and cellular. So that is interesting, which means that in the future, we could have speeds in cellular in our cell phones data rates that are just as fast as the top speeds in Wi-Fi. And the reason why is because at the end, they all are based on the same physics, just radios. So there's no reason why cellular should be slower than Wi-Fi. It's, it's just infrastructure. And we are already seeing this trend. This is only going up to 2015. But um, 2020, around 2020, roughly, a lot of the telecoms are working on pushing 5G. And 5G is supposed to have 10 gigabits data rates. So imagine a world where you have mobile devices that could have data access speeds of 10 gigabits. What could we do different? Because that's also as, almost as fast as a lot of uh, our wireless or Wi-Fi uh, speeds at home. So that changes things. So at some point, though, we'll reach some fundamental human limit where um, we, we want more speed, but why do we want more speed and data rates? is all to push more data for uh, processing and consuming information and data. So there's also another extrapolation that at some point will reach some fundamental human limit that the, our human eyeballs can process only so many pixels per second. And at that point, if wireless data transfer rate hit that human pixel eye processing rate, we won't need any more wired connections because wireless will be sufficient for everything, because right now the highest bandwidth data consumption for us is really uh, visual information. So taking all these components, um, how should we really design AR systems that are, in a sense, robust for the future? And as part of that, it's kind of taking the trends and our cell phones are starting to look really much uh, in terms of processing and uh, capabilities like uh, desktop computers or servers, even servers. So part of that is uh, in terms of programming and building system, we should really have just stand on shoulders of giants and use the abstractions that we learned as an industry as a whole and just use them and apply them to, to developing software for mobile devices or for, for uh, AR systems. So I think this is an exciting time to work in AR because this is a convergence of where the technology trends are going and where uh, is early enough to start building and making a lot of progress. So with that, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about systems design's principle for distributed systems. So taking that idea of uh, now phones are looking, starting to look like servers. Why don't we program them like servers? So concepts and servers. Uh, good principles is uh, decreasing processing time of computation so that you can handle more requests. And with that, for example, you have collocation so that you can reduce any overhead associated with fetching data required for processing a work or collocating the data near the code. So how do we do that? Or caching, a lot of caching. We spend a lot of time thinking about caching. Um, so caching and abstractions for that also applied for AR. How do we do that? Or the concept of uh, remoting. So reducing the time spent accessing remote services. So, for example, we have done a lot of uh, interfaces that are more coarse-grained. And part of that, sometimes with remoting, we've seen uh, many level structures of accessing data, like uh, CDN, in between, your, in, in between your actual cloud where it's hosted and the CDN, and then you're actually accessing to fetch the data there. So applications around there. Or, Sharding, so sharding has to do with truly stateless components that can simply be scaled out and the work can be balanced between them. So in, in, in distributed systems, you have this whole, whole concept of how do we shard processes so that you don't have hotspotting and do that properly and have as much as possible a unit distribu uniform distribution, right? 
And the other big one is really concurrency to achieve scalability. And in particular in this world where we're going into many, 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 many data, many, many servers running, and also many, many cores, it's important to be able to program in concurrently. So part of it is like pooling resources to reduce the overhead associated by moving things around too much. Parallelization by decreasing time to compute a particular uni unit of work decomposed and done at the same time. And as much as possible, uh, try to not have any locks in your code. That's hard <laughs> if you're trying to do uh, multi-threaded programming. Uh, try to minimize the contention of shared resources uh, by really thinking and reasoning about uh, the criti critical paths in your code. And concurrency is, is um, it's very hard. We still don't have it right, but there's been models now uh, in the industry where we've learned and done better. So with that, the one-to-one -one mapping on how we apply this in AR, um, decreasing processing time is really trying to achieve that principle of real-time processing, because this whole thing about AR, processing frames and having that as much as possible hit 30 frames per second, you really want to be the real-time and apply as many concepts in uh, decreasing processing time. The other one is, as you enter a world of many, many devices, you can start thinking about them and maybe sharing some of the computation of your co located in the same place, like in Pokemon Go, right? You're all together in the same place. Maybe a concept of um, charting, smart charting. And of course, uh, scalability via concurrency. And on this, we are moving in the world where Moore's law is not necessarily scaling as much in the single core. It's very much multi-core. I mean, uh, iPhone, right? I guess a lot of uh, mobile devices now are at least six or eight cores. Uh, so that has to do with how do we do learning some of the best practices with log-free programming or actor models, which are mostly applied in distributed systems, but I haven't seen them much in applied in mobile devices. So today's talk, I'm going to only just focus on one of the aspects for how do we apply some of the concepts for real time in the networking and also with uh, concurrency. So those are the two that we'll tackle. There's a lot more that I could cover, but don't have as much time. So speeding up networking, uh, the whole thing about AR is that AR is really in life is in real time, and AR you're experiencing in the real world and interacting, so you really do need this, um, this real time aspect because as you get the camera feed of 30 frames per second, you have to have a response time depending on the different applications within a frame, which really means a response time of 33 milliseconds, which is very low. So how do we achieve that? So now I'm gonna play a demo of some of the work we've done. And what you're going to see here is uh, actual game footage of a multiplayer AR puzzle solving game. And in here, actual players are cloaked in an avatar. They look almost as if they were rigged to follow a pre planned path. But in reality, our multiplayer AR technology has such a low latency and so good that. It just the tracking on their phones. By tracking, I mean um, the camera position of their phone in AR is just is just connected to the phone, and that's how it just works. And what you see here are players interacting in a physical physical way with the digital objects, and this is all possible because of the reaction time and processing that it all feels real. And they're pulling and turning, having statues around here. And in this part, it looks funny when you're not in AR. It just looks people walking around. But when you're there, it's actually quite fun. So the thing that's fun about here is that everyone is sharing the same reality together at the same time. And they need to work together at the same time at the end here to paddle this, uh, oh, I guess they paddle the energy, yeah, to paddle the energy orb in a bit here to unlock the puzzle that you just saw. So what is cool about here is really low latency multiplayer AR working. So how do we go about building at least the network layer for that? So we have a couple design choices in here. So we have not real time, 
choices of technology, real time. We have the ability to send messages over the wire, over the network, either reliable messages or unreliable. So in the world of uh, reliable messages, you have, uh, but, but not real time, you have uh, HTTP or REST, which is easy to scale. There's tons of uh, uh, infrastructure already to develop here, easy to code, lots of support, but it doesn't meet our real time requirements for AR. With WebSockets, it's, um, it's somewhat real time, but not as real time. It has really hundreds of milliseconds of latency when you have a centralized server that's deployed somewhere uh, and uses still the web stack technology that could be somewhat heavyweight for what we need because in here we're just sending a lot of uh, computer vision data which could be very small, a lot smaller than we don't need that whole header for, for web. It would be good maybe for part of the problem of sharing the AR maps but not everything. So now we have this other world of uh, more real time, but with unreliable messages, which is really fast. Well, okay, yeah, you, you don't want to design for that quadrant on, the, on, the, on, the, on there, where it's really like slow and not real time and unreliable messages that really the US Postal Office, so we don't design for that, but just, just to make it fit uh, a full two by two. But going back to UDP, uh, we have, um, can be really fast, can be used uh, via peer to peer, but the problem with uh, in, in AR or games is that it's bad for server authority or uh, anti-cheat. It requires also advanced techniques to share, to send very large messages because UDP uh, protocol has, uh, in order to be fast, you, you want to fit certain size of messages. So our ideal solution would be somewhere there somehow magically. We want it to be cross-platform. We want it to run on all cell phones with, that have limited resources. We want it to be able to send small and large messages. We want to be able to work on all networks, Wi-Fi, LTE, or bad signal connections like 3G or 2G, et cetera, and to enable real time. So how do we go about designing for that space? So first of all, there's no magic bullet that fits in both. The way we solve this is um, having, actually using both pieces kind of a combination of uh, TCP and UDP. So a little bit about how that works. Uh, regular, um, regular cloud applications today, you, the, for let's say we're to build this AR app where you're sharing this avatar and camera post position to everyone in the game. Uh, cell phone uh, one sends my AR tracking position to the cell tower and the cell tower back to the server and the server might be somewhere far away like in Virginia or Iceland or who knows where. And then back from the server to the cell tower, back to my friend who's just next to me and playing with me. And that whole round trip really takes, in the order of magnitude, more than hundreds of milliseconds. And of course, by then, you're, you will already have moved, and it will be late, and the whole experience will just look bad. So this won't work. So what we've done, actually, is with our technology, we got rid of the hop to the cloud and established a peer-to-peer -peer network between phones, so they just talk to the cell tower. So our technology optimizes for real-time AR that achieves latencies that are in the tens of milliseconds. In this way, you're, when you're sending your camera position in AR, I'm sending it to the cell tower and directly back to, 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 my, phone, to my friend who's next to me. And the nice thing, the property about AR that's nice is that is somewhat guaranteed that you're gonna go through the same cell tower because you're somewhat co-located. You're physically next to your friends. It's very likely that you're gonna ping them in the same cell tower. So that's a nice plus. And to put this into perspective at this point, um, when you're rendering, I guess, as I was mentioning, 30 frames per second, you need a response time of 33 milliseconds. So within this solution of peer-to-peer, -peer, you do really do get the AR data just in time and fit within that, that budget of period. And this way you can achieve extremely low latencies and you can see where your friend is, not where they were if you were to do the other solution. Now, how the architecture starts looking, starts looking something like this. When you start building, let's say there's seven phones in a game, it is a peer-to-peer -peer network, so they're all fully connected like a mesh network. And they also talk to the server for more the server authority pieces of it and uh, to enable uh, sending larger messages. So this looks awfully familiar to some of the diagrams of how different data center layouts or services are. 
when you start having fully connected uh, nodes of uh, servers talking to each other and sending data because they have a very fast network they can rely on. And what we're expecting in here is in the future we'll get there where we'll all have a very fast network and this will just work. I mean, today is actually working too, but it'll work better, right? Yeah, so now the other pieces um, that I'm gonna talk about is uh, speeding up computation. So I think I mentioned a little bit how computer vision is hard and there's still lots of research and PhDs working on solving tons of problems. So at a high level, one of the core problems in augmented reality, what I mentioned earlier is this concept of uh, understanding and building this map of the world with, with uh, SLAM. At a hi very high level, I'm kind of abstracting lots of blocks in here, many, many, many blocks. At a high level, how uh, AR, SLAM, computation pipeline look. This is really, really high level, the 10,000 bird view, bird view of it. You have um, sort of your camera and image inputs coming in, and then you have this computation block that uh, extracts features because you don't want this super high bandwidth data. You extract it into some matrix that is a lot more lower dimension, and that gets passed into two blocks, either your localization computation or your mapping. So you're doing both simultaneously, localizing and mapping. And then they're both kind of writing to the AR map. And you see how this becomes really hard to program if you do it just regular sequential uh, programming or the naive way of just putting blocks around them. It becomes very hard. And just to give you an um, idea in terms of the numbers, this is a paper um, that came out this year, Embedding SLAM, and they did a benchmark on a couple of algorithms for SLAM running on different hardware. Um, what you see here, uh, there's the desktop, there's laptop, there's the TX1, which is the Jetson GPU embedded device, there's the XU4, the Odroid, X, the Odroid. IMX6, which is another kind of embedded device with an ARM A9 architecture, Panda ES, which is another also embedded architecture. So to extrapolate how this looks for phones or in the future AR headsets, is somewhere between the somewhere between the light cyan, yellow, red, or, or or dark red. So those are the expectations, the expected computation that would run if you try to run this. This is a whole one cycle of it. So it could be as bad as um, one second, and by that time you have already lost. You will miss your budget for real time AR. There are other algorithms that uh, are more in the hundreds of milliseconds with fast slam 2.0, but there's definitely trade offs. With that, the um, accuracy of that is not as high, but you trade it off for speed. But what if you wanted to still have the high quality maps that are created either for algorithms like OrthLAM or, um, or Linear SLAM? How could you still have really high quality algorithms, but without compromising the computation? So the reality is that all these algorithms, when you implement them, they all look like this, because that's sort of the naive implementation. The easy is just, let's just put mutex everywhere and then wait. And then everything is kind of busy waiting in loops a lot of times. So what if we took some of the best practices and distributed systems programming and concurrency and apply things like actor models, right? So the thing, uh, what the pr principle about actor models is that uh, CPUs are now getting in faster, and what's happening is that now we just have more cores, and we need to be better at programming concurrently. So the actor model is really motivated by the highly parallel computer machines and hundreds of them, and independent independent uh, microprocessors that you want to as much as possible isolate the computation. So at a high level conceptual way actor models work, you split out your computation into actors, which all have uh, maintained their own internal state that is not mutated by anyone else. And the way you do synchronization is via message passing. And the actor models are available in many of the great languages that we know. They're in Erlang, they're in Elixir, in libraries like Aka or Celluloid for Ruby, or uh, you could actually also zero MQ. And the nice thing about them is that you are able to achieve uh, brokerless topologies that are resi resilient to failures. And synchronization points also are expensive and bad for scalability. And here you cut them down into just message passing into that 
core unit. So, so, so that is enough, message passing is enough for concurrency. So now if you were to program this world and restructure that, um, that slam algorithm that I showed you, how it really now looks, it looks like this at a very high level. There's many, many more actors in reality when we implement this, but at a very high level. Now everything becomes an actor and you have a message queue at the center passing all the messages around so that you now have your image feed and sensor data as its own actor, sending the data and structuring as you need it, and writing it into the message queue. And then the feature structure goes on its own time, and there's no really busy waiting. And then the localization actor or mapping actor just consumes off of the message queue. And the nice thing about um, actors is that you can think of them as each of them having like a mailbox, and each of the messages are actually processed sequentially. And the nice thing about them is you can now scale them up and have many, many of them, many, many threads doing the feature structure or many, many threads doing the localization actor or the mapping actor. And at the, t at the end, you have your internal database that you're writing to, your, to yourself to maintain the state of this AR map that you're building. And, and this is how, I, anecdotally, we had the initial version of uh, our SLAM Vince VIO algorithm that was not real time. <laughs> And then when we didn't change any algorithms, we didn't discover any new math, didn't discover any new computer vision, exact same computation, restructure it, better architecture and better abstractions. First of all, the code is easier to work with, easier to read and maintain and test because you have these individual blocks. And we achieve a speeds up of five times, just restructuring the code by removing all the logs and the busy waiting. So previously, there's, this diagram doesn't do it justice, but there's a lot of busy waiting, a lot. So that was one of the powers of bringing the concepts of programming distributed systems into the world of AR. So I got to give credits and thanks to a lot of these concepts for this talk to Pete Turner, who's in my team and learning a lot of, about this abstraction, and also to the rest of the team um, for the AR engineering at Niantic. And uh, thanks. So we're also hiring, if you're interested in working in actor models for AR, you can either ping me or apply directly and send a note about it. So I think, thank you. <laughs>